title of uh, this middle one of the three was quite deliberate to use the word depiction rather than drawing, although I guess most of what I'm showing you is drawings. What interested me if in the first and the third lectures I will return to mostly built buildings and the sort of rhetoric of the, of, of the built object. Um, what interests me about this question of stuff in relation to what has happened in architecture, say, in the last hundred years, is that it has had a, a curious and sometimes, I think, detached relationship to the kind of architecture that, let us say, would be mostly discussed in this room during the 50 years I've known this room and probably the 50 years before that. In other words, that the majority of discussions about meaningful, experimental, progressive, uh, notable, worth crossing the street for architecture have tended to be discussions about, as I said last week, about the physique in terms of position, the attitude in terms of motive, possibly um, explosions of mannerisms of organization, but not greatly to do with the stuff from which they're made or the stuff as a conglomerate. Yes, there was a long time ago an excitement, I guess, to the generation that, that rediscovered concrete. And certainly, my generation used to enjoy reading about the period when glass, more particularly plate glass, hit the architectural scene. And then, latterly, we have plastics materials. I don't want this going off in the middle of the thing. Uh, we have plastics materials. And we have all the wonderful inventions of materiality that have happened, particularly in the last 20 years, that make the sort of diagrams that I see in your annual exhibition here possible, but not in a way very discussable. It is assumed that they will either be done in concrete or some kind of sort of vaguely white-colored slurry, or hopefully something that's sort of a manufacturable slurry. And there it goes. My first picture uh, is by Arnold Schoenberg. Uh, don't worry, you haven't come into an amateur music discussion. But it is interesting, isn't it, that there we have somebody who is who was certainly considered highly experimental in his field, attempting to depict stuff. And it um, intrigues me and amuses me that the composer Schoenberg, presumably part of that milieu that, 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 that more relaxedly than perhaps in our own time and in our own city, makes it possible for a musician to make a painting and for a poet to make a painting and an architect to make poetry, etc., etc., etc. And certainly Vienna was such a place. So Schoenberg does this thing, something in the eye of the storm, and some indication of some kind of weirdo. Is it a, is it a sort of hedgehog coming out of the rain? Is it a flower? Is it a mist? Is it wheat? Who knows? I'm not sure that he knew. I'm not sure that he cared, but he, want, he, he, he incurred within that uh, territory of stuff. And after all, um, the late Albin Boyarsky, when he was here, lent me once a book uh, about the biography of a lady called Alma Mahler, who was not only the wife of both Mahler and Gropius, uh, the mistress of Kokoschka, and knocked off just about everybody else that you ever read about in, in Austrian cultural history of the period. Uh, so that, that suggests that there was a, shall we say, relaxed uh, breaking of the boundaries of territory 
Uh, but I digress uh, only a little bit because I think these things are also of interest. Here's a drawing of stuff just about discernible. I think it's Santa Lea. I've, I've, I've lost the... the <laughs> I scanned it some days ago. <laughs> I've lost the, the book or can't find the book that I scanned it from. It doesn't matter. I think it was Santa Lea. It's a little... It's just enough to tell that there's an arrangement of stuff and that for some reason Santa Lea, if it is him, and I think it's him, uh, decides that there's something that needs to be solid and something that needs to be mannered and something that needs to be sort of in line with something and that's about it. But the solid bit is very interesting. The black smudge suggests that for whatever reason that piece of the assemblage has to be treated differently from the rest. And here's another bit of smudgy rubbish. Well, it's, 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 I think it's, um, it's uh, Bruno Tart. If it's not, I'm not sure whether it's Tart or Pulsi. There's probably somebody, there's usually somebody sitting in the audience who says, no, it was actually, it was not Tart or Pulsi. It was Otto Schnank, and it was 1993. But uh, you don't look like that kind of audience, you probably don't know any better than I do. I think it's actually Pulsig, but so, or it could be, you know, it could be Tart or Roth Day. Anyhow, for some reason, there's enough of the stuff indicated uh, for solid and void. We can see windows, we can see some kind of speciality item in the middle, and we can see some kind of tailoring of the foreground with the same charcoal, so that the tailoring of the foreground suggests that Pulsig, I think it's him, wouldn't leave alone. He'd do something to the ground. And he was going to do something very special in the middle, and it's a heavy, hard arm smudge says special. <laughs> means windows. But, isn't it interesting that Bruno Tart, and, and I found this when I was checking out the lecture early this morning, that I hadn't actually included much Bruno Tart, even though in a sense, if we take another route into some of the, uh, the first of the stuff I'm showing you, Tart is an absolutely pivotal figure, but I think almost Tart, though I'm no historian, Tart almost deserves a lecture on his own as a phenomenon, and I can, I can certainly put it on record that it was the introduction by Peter Bannum Peter Rayner Bannum writing in the Architectural Review uh, that led me, after graduating from this place, to buy one of my first books, about the first book I didn't nick from a library or, or borrow. Uh, and I rushed up to a place called Tarantis and ordered this Ulstein Bauwelt a reproduction of, uh, of Frulich on, on the back of his review, only to discover, <laughs> naive that I was, it was all in German. And there are only five pictures in it. I've still got the book, you know, just to show I'm clever. But um, it's interesting, I'm digressing horribly already, but it's interesting that for once, pre-tout buildings, we see a piece of tout messing around with bits. The depiction is using some pieces of 3D model, toy-like, and he's obviously enjoying himself. Though we associate his his uh, projects of this period mostly with drawings, except, of course, the glass pavilion in Cologne, which perhaps used some of these bits. I wasn't there. I don't know, but I'd like to get... But it's so the business of depiction, that's why I use the word depict rather than draw, De depiction, the, the, the anticipation of the possibility of, of the substance, can be done with other substances. And any of us who've ever made models know that there's an irritating and wonderful thing about model making. I mean, I don't mean computer models, I mean real models, uh, stuffed models, uh, which is that models enable you to contemplate the thing at, at any speed you wish and to turn it to any angle you wish and to stick your finger in your nose, your eye, your model scope, whatever, in. At your own, at your own pace quite differently from these awful fly-through fly things. But 
the model never quite gets it. You have to get to about one to two before the model actually does the things that the real thing would do. You get to about one to five, one to ten, one to twenty, you're using glue instead of putty. You're using glue instead of hinges. You're using drawn-on lines instead of mullions or whatever it might be. But here, this is a, this is a kind of int interesting model because the model itself talks about organization of form, but it's also of the stuff, and it has a this lovely sort of lumpy, jelly-like, toy-like quality. And then Hans Pilsig, who was still hovering around early, you know, early 20th century in, in or around the German-speaking land. Pilsig, of course, made some buildings, and most of the drawings that we see reproduced tend to be in black and white, or at least they're reproduced in black and white. Here's a rare occasion when some of his sort of exuberant ceiling conditions are shown in color. Now, the irritating thing about the drawing is that it doesn't really show very much how it would be done. It only just about tells you what, what the form might be. But there's something about the color that tells you that he was already aware of major elements and minor elements, that somehow the minor elements would have a would have a sort of more ethereal condition. There's just a bit of black smudge saying, ah, yes, but I know it's going to sort of have form and it's going to land on the ground. Ah, now we have, can't, I could, I've lost the caption of this one, but it's one of those blokes hanging around that sort of area. This is <laughs> wonderful, Art Sheffield, non-historian. One of those blokes hanging around that part part of the world at around that kind of time. Somebody will then tell me the name of him. But what is interesting is as soon as you make a precise edge drawing, uh, how the architect or drawer was more given to particularizing the foreground, the ground, than quite what the building stuff would be. He put some sort of general purpose decoy dots. I don't think it's just age of the drawing. I think they're deliberate decoy dots to say, I know it's going to be substance, and I know the dome substance is going to be a little bit darker, but don't, don't, <laughs> don't ask me any more. It will be useful stuff, you know, stone if we can afford it, render if we can't, if we're familiar with that, aren't we? Um, but the foreground, yes, I can be much more precise about that. It's going to have this sort of rock, and the vegetation will come there, and then there will be this sort of chalk escarpment there, and so on. all done in a black line. It's interesting that. I'm not sure it was consciously a decoy, or that the guy felt more comfortable drawing the ground, didn't want to be cornered on what the stuff might be. See, I'm, I'm intrigued by this sort of love-hate relationship. And then we have a very weird bit of drawing, and I think this is Paul Gersh, who seems to crop up ar around. I've now got some more specific dates. Uh, a man who was executed by the Nazis. I don't know whether because they didn't like the way he drew or he'd, he'd done other things that didn't, you know, they probably Jewish or something. Anyhow... <coughs> There he is doing some very funny indications of surfacing. More sort of, you know, more, more kind of knickerbocker glory than, than necessarily uh, correct interpretations of neo-Gothic. But fascinating nonetheless, the, the question of stuff as decoration comes in. And this is Gersh again with a drawing called Temple of the year 1919, same guy executed by the Nazis. And here we get a very definite beginnings of particularization. The fruity bits will li literally be out of the Knickerbocker glory uh, world, the ice cream world. The more circumspect bits, that is to say arches, walls between arches and columns, and pilasters, if that's what they are, uh, will be in more relatively serious colors, if you call purple and pink 
serious. Well, they are by the standards of this drawing. And then something at the top which hints at sort of vegetation, but then it can't be vegetation because the inside of the arches is the same color. So, I mean, one's playing around searching for clues. To what extent Gersh was, a, was an architect? I think not. I think he was one of those guys hovering around the edges of the architectural scene. But he serves to inspire. And here is another very curious drawing of the same period. I think it's the same guy. Uh, which then starts to have very specific sort of icon. I don't mean in the iconic sense, but I the old sense. You know, icon indications. The building held within the building, like a toy. And those two domes, or are they sort of British Raj generals standing behind? They almost look as if they're British in pith helmets. Uh, looking on. Very curious drawing with the captured, the architecture of the captured piece and then another scale of architecture. Putting architecture into architecture because in depiction you can of course if you wish jump scales. You can jump sensible references. You don't, it doesn't have to be correct and that's the wonderful thing about drawing and about predictive drawing and about depiction is that it doesn't have to be correct. It can be better than correct. You can explore simultaneously things which as soon as you stick it on the computer or as soon as you scale it even uh, start to be questionable and editable. A great favorite of mine, don't know much about him, but he was another friend of Tout, a guy called Carl Kreil. And I can report that when Warren Chalk and I were preparing Archigram 4, <coughs> the one that made reference in, on the one hand to Frulicht and on the other hand to Chicago Adventure Comics of the 40s and 50s. Crail was the intriguing one who looked, who did drawings that were so similar to the guys in doing the comics in Chicago. Well, I suppose one ought to reverse it. One might say that the guys doing the comics in Chicago look very similar to Carl Kreil. I have no knowledge, no way of knowing whether, you know, his nephew happened to be in Chicago or somebody was reading somebody's letters or what. Or they literally, something was buzzing around. Yeah, it is decorative. It could be argued that it's because it's a little bit more pinpointed than some of the first drawings I've been showing you, that <coughs> it falls into the trap of you wanting to interrogate it. You're wanting to interrogate perhaps that piece and say, now come on, Carl, is it a scroll? Is it applied? Is it recessed? That is definitely a window. That is probably bar relief. But what is that? If that is a window, is that a window too? Or are we being already pedantic. If, as I've just said, the important usefulness of the drawing, the predictive drawing, is to break the rules, then you can actually, in a way, creatively suspend judgment as to whether that is a window or a piece of implantation. You can hold it in the air or in your brain and say, I will tell you later whether it's going to be a window or an implantation. For the moment, it is a something that might be one or might be t'other, and that this probably is a window condition, but I, I reserve the right to change my mind, not as we usually do in terms of position and saying, oh, I don't quite think that's in the right place, let's move it to the right, which we do all the time, but to say it might be in the right place and the substantive nature of it is up for grabs or to be questioned. So in a sense what I'm saying is that this whole business of stuff and predictive stuff is to do with the business of design. Here's an old favorite of mine uh, from my drawings book. The English 19th century like, as the English often do, to be very pedantic you know, actually 
in terms of composition compared with some of the things I've been showing, this is almost orthodox. But my God, the guy enjoys fussing around. Wow. It's like, it's, it's very English. It's sort of like a piece of after-dinner bladder, which my, my of course, pre-lunch bladder, but uh, blathering around. I, I say, I've got a rather interesting story. And jolly, you know, it's all jolly interesting stuff. I think it's very English in that respect, whereas the, 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 the German stuff of a bit later is sort of, ah, there's a statement, oh, here's the thing, here's the thing. Well, shall I do it? Well, let's have another gin and tonic. Mm. <laughs> I think it, uh, the culture is always there. Uh, and, then, and then we're into, into the same kind of architecture, actually, Sort of, but done again in the Germanic way of the of the spooky hard statement. And then we come to a building that exists, uh, the Goethe name. Quite interesting to see that the in one of the initial drawings is not really to do with the stuff as a material, but very much to do with the stuff as, as carved, as, 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 as fashioned. We assume that to do this sort of thing, probably correctly, that it's solid, and that that door is a door. It's very clearly a door, and that, sure, sure as hell, is likely to be solid. Certainly at that time, beginning early part of the 20th century would have been solid, although now, of course, we could vacuum form it, or we could injection mold it, or we could do some kind of stuffery with it, uh, which might make it translucent. But no, it's a reasonable prediction that it is solid, and the important thing is not whether it's red, pink, yellow, or, or no fine concrete, but that it is carvable, that it is moldable. And indeed, crappy photograph, but yes, it is. The Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, which held sway for a very long time, in fact, I have often said that I think that American architecture still has not escaped from it. To my mind, a lot of contem contemporary American architecture mainstream contemporary American architecture is still organized in such a way that things tend to come in on axis, things tend to be rather pompous, rather four square, and it is no accident that some of the most important American architects in the history of the, the, the emergence of American architecture went across and studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and then came back doing that thing. The renditions around the Ecole de Beaux are, of course, are fascinating. What, what intrigues me here is where the designer has put the emphasis. He has assumed that we're interested. The wall is very particular and very solid. A lot of trouble has gone into drawing that wall. The temple, or whatever it is, uh, doesn't require so much special drawing. Everybody at the Beaux Arts, everybody hanging around there, and everybody would be looking at this drawing from then till now, would be perfectly familiar with seeing end on elevations of, of uh, Greek derivation temple and portico type. Uh, but what is quite amusing is the little fun and games, the little decorative toys that are laid out in front of it and coloured. And, and the funny bloke that's put at the top in the, in, in the, in the pediment, he's actually amused, rather enjoying himself, that bloke up there. And maybe the person designing the project was enjoying himself putting the bloke up there. Certainly, obviously, didn't get failed because it's made it into Drexler's book hence into my scan machine. But I'm intrigued where you take something that's as commonplace as a bloody great stone wall and as commonplace as a neo-Greek temple, and then you piss around with it. And I think that's, 
that shows a certain kind of relaxedness uh, or boredom, perhaps. When we get to Otto Wagner, I don't suppose it was Otto who drew the drawing. I think by the time this stuff was done, he had an, you know, the Viennese equivalent of Foster's office. And there are always these fascinating things you read about Otto Wagner. A lot of the stuff on the Ringstrasse that we don't see in the books was, was you know, Wagner making a, a few bucks uh, to keep his amazing office going. And of course the office had, I'm digressing a bit, but just to give to flesh it, you know, just like the Foster's offices of now, have some pretty bright people working in them that then emerge as themselves. It is no <coughs> surprise that, that Otto Wagner had a whole series of, of key figures that, that then emerged in their own right. What's interesting here is, though, that, that Wagner... And, and the office was able to play with neoclassicism in such a, such a sort of cavalier manner that it rapidly became something else. When depicting it, um, it's an interesting sort of psychology going on here. When depicting it, you presumably the thought was, and I'm just inventing my own script, that you didn't need to do anything special with the basic material. It would probably be marble anyway. Uh, you need to very much particularize the stature and the lion. You need to be specific that the bloke on the statue is going to have his sort of turquoise, yellow, and brown clothing, and that the lion had particularly you know, his blood, blood-curdling chin. Uh, and the bloke watching it was wearing a circumspect brown raincoat. Or whatever. But you selected that coloration, which was obviously preferred by the artist, or by Wagner, for, draw, for kind of inserting into the proposition. And the, the insertions, the little squared insertions, and the little sort of reinvented column caps become the focus. Said the rest will be marble. We do what we do. We do it with marble, with specials. That's quite a, that's stuff as well. It's not really delineation. It's 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 back to the sort of beauty spot to draw attention to the beauty of the face. For his own house, second villa, uh, he becomes more specific and presumably totally indulgent. He's also or somebody is enjoying themselves above the door. I think to have a sort of grinning, toothy uh, thing above your door is not a bad idea. You know, it's like sort of saying, beware of the dog or something. So beware of the ghosts of this house. They might bite. I love it. Uh, and then, you know, I I if in doubt, stick some decoration. So that, again, there are presumptions made about the... the uh, door, and if you notice the plan, it's quite an interesting doorway. It actually comes out as a mouth. It comes forward out of the, the building as a sort of layered bar relief. But not enough. He then wants to call attention to certain horizontal conditions. I presume it's tiled. Sorry about the rough photo. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in the somewhere in a cardboard box, I got a slide of it. But these days, it's quicker to go to the book and scan because you look for the slide. On to Mendelssohn. Now, what we are most familiar, and I showed, if you remember, last week I showed the Einstein term, uh, to which I now, in a roundabout way, return. Typical Mendelssohn drawings, the ones that we all know and love, and which are apparently, I've never seen them in the real, but apparently they're very small. Mendelssohn could knock out buildings like that, just sort of almost on the end of a thumb. Wonderful. And, and it's, it's very discussable that to what more do you need? You know, almost, and I suspect it used to happen, Mendelssohn could almost hand these to some bloke who knew about working drawings. And and they could build it if you make certain assumptions about the substance. Albeit that then, when you go to see the um, 
the building in the Kofirstendam, the, the Schönbrunn, in fact, he uses brick sometimes. And the detailing was really rather good. So either he knew exactly who to have at his elbow uh, or something. This is a Mendelssohn drawing too. It's much less familiar. And uh, weird, Mendelssohn didn't do colored drawings very often. And it's very splodgy. And formally, it's much less interesting. Interest, I, I find that fascinating. What, what was he doing sort of messing about? Maybe he didn't use the right paper or something, or maybe he wanted it to be splodgy. I don't know. Maybe it was a sort of doing it on holiday. I don't know. It's weird because it flies in the face of what we assume. We can make the very easy assumption. Black and white, thumbnail drawing, straight to detail a building. But no, here Mendelssohn is also wanting to talk about color, and perhaps about surface, but he never used anything that remotely was like a sort of crazy paving wall. So what the hell was going on? I don't know the answer. I just stick it in to confuse the issue, because I think I don't like, in my own mind, to be too comfortable about this. I don't have formulae as, as consequence of what I'm saying. I just want to throw in some puzzlements. Ah, we're on safer ground. Now we can say, yes, it was necessary to transfer Mendelssohn's ideas into formalized drawings. And there we are. It's some poor bugger was sitting there with a you know, compass and a measuring device, making sure it could be done, even if you had to use brick at the back and so on and so forth. And there it is. And that is an easier issue. Once you have decided that it's all done in a sort of cement slurp, uh, and it doesn't matter how the fuck you keep it up there, as long as you put bits of metal and bits of stone, bits of wood, bits of brick, anything, just hold it there, make it thick enough so it won't fall down. Great. So it's back, back into, you know, the sorts of, of things that some of you do upstairs, which is where Rule does that, and it will be done in some sort of presumably white material if not white, blue. And there it is. And it's very, it, the, the photograph is sufficiently bland that you can see that it works. And all you've got to do is to sort of tart it up every 80 years with a bit more cement and keep it going. And why not? I think that's lovely. And, and the best bit is the bit in the hedge. Way ahead of his time. Back to Santa Lea doing, sorry about the, the scan, well, it's not really a sort of checkerboard, but it just scans that way. Um, Santa Lea putting the basic formal, and, and I think what I will come back to in the final lecture of these three is back to the question of form. One of the things I find very, very difficult about minimalist architecture, why really I think intrinsically find it tedious is that if you take away an interest in stuff, if you take away any particular interest in the materiality and the presence of a building, and if you take away an interest in form, if you say, no, we don't go for form, we go for the most, then it's rather, it's so dry that's that's my view. I, I think you know. I can't I can't uh, avoid a partisan position. Now this is a funny one. This is actually um, Hermann Finsterlin. Now most of what we find in in the books of Finsterlin is material that's much less specific than this. Is that a funny square thing happening on it? God, oh, that's not that's weird. It doesn't appear on my screen. Uh, anyway, it's. A simple design for a house that Finsterlin we think of as a sort of formal delineator. Under pressure, or just occasionally, he could be persuaded to do something that was buildable. And here he reduces the, the substance to two things, either the universal white material slurped on or whatever, and that the 
that blue would be important. And I think that because he was such an important drawer of things, that blue has to be taken very seriously. There is, of course, the whole parallel development of the consciousness of stuff via artists such as Schwitters. And I came uh, only the other day to look again, twice in, this, in the three months period, to look at the Mertzbau in Hanover. And I think that the more interesting architects of my own period, and perhaps still now, are very conscious of the work of people like Schwitters, very conscious of the fact that certain artists suggest the way forward or the way, the way to, to concentrate. The artist as, as inventive and naughty as Schwitters took a great delight in this borderline between the deliberate and the casual. De deliberately and casually collecting materials of a different kind and putting them in juxtaposition with each other until you're in a funny territory. You're saying, is he sending the whole thing up or is he selecting very particularly? And he's not going to tell you which he's doing when. So as we track around the drawing, we say, that looks pretty deliberate. They're all lining up on a line. Uh, and that one isn't, and that is nicely, is rather sweetly composed with that. But then what's Father Christmas doing, hanging upside down? Well, is that just, is that being naughty? And that bit of, of almost Van Dersbergy stuff, is that borrowed? Is that talking to that? And then anyhow, was he getting a bit bored and he'd run out of stuff, so he just splurged a bit of colour. I mean, because I'm caught me right in the middle of finishing a drawing myself today, which is a willful one, I, I'm, that's going through my own mind. You get to a bit where you say, oh, Oh, let's just do what I usually do there because it's, let's get to the end of it. On the other hand, if one makes enough fuss about the very, con like that, the, you know, am I being over for them? The existence of that very particular white sliver there, he was too good to just, he wanted that piece of emphasis, I have no, no doubt. Could he have substituted another doll-like figure for that one as long as it was upside down? Probably, probably had a cardboard box full of these things. Oh. <laughs> and I think that's something, that sort of attitude is something which architects are less able to do um, because we're always worried about consistency and so on. So when one goes inside the Mertzbau, and I've tried twice in the last three months to sort of secretly take the photograph myself without the, they have about four attendants that hover around you. At the, the, at the slightest sound of a click from your pocket. I've even tried the old iPhone trick, which is, this is not really a camera, it's a telephone. They're up to that one. It goes back into your pocket. Uh, so I have to take it out of the book, but you get the point. And anyhow, it's pretty monochromatic. There's a little bit of red here and there. But, you know, he didn't necessarily need the... Um, he didn't need a wide range of textures and colors in order to make the point, compositional point. The stuff is sort of wood with gungy white paint on it. Back to a building that does exist through some stages. Um, this is the Hurst building uh, in the, on the suburb of Frankfurt, Hurst, the Hurst chemical company um, by Peter Behrens. Behrens, of course, was an artist who got into architecture. And I, I think, as far as one can make out, almost immediately had lots of sort of experienced acolytes around him. So he probably never really had to learn about doing work in drawings. He just was a great artiste, and they came and he sorted them out. So here is somebody, not him, I suspect, drawing the intentions of this, this hall, this great hall with the illumination from the top. Here is a colored drawing of the hall because in fact it is made of glazed, colored glazed brick. And here's the building itself. Sorry it's not a color photograph. Um, 
it, it should be because it is a coloured building. And what is, if we just backtrack, what is lost or gained at each stage? There were maybe modifications between this stage and that. There were maybe simplifications made here in order for the effects of the drawing. But my God, the building is pretty notable anyhow. And I think this is the issue of predictive stuff. Nice one. A guy called Wenzel Hablik. Uh, 1903, the Crystal Building. So for the historian, interesting that Hablik starts doing his stuff a little bit before uh, Bruno Taut. Taut is the guy always associated with Crystal. And then Finsel and all these other guys join into the glass chain. But Hablik seems to have been operating 10 years before. If I was a historian, this would be worthy of much research. I haven't got time. I'm just intrigued. I throw it at you because chicken and egg is always something of interest. Now, Hablik, who was Viennese anyhow, uh, concentrates upon the stuff of the roof. Isn't it interesting how roof seems to be uh, fair game? Concentrates about upon a roof of a reasonable colour. Also is interesting is interested in in the foreground, the ground part, and then says the building will sort of be pink. Well, we know sort of there are castles around. In inner Europe, which is sort of vaguely pink, and they get stained, and then they get sort of moss on them and so on. So maybe he's not too far off the point. Then he puts a funny flower at the top of the building. That's weird. Don't know why he did that. And uh, maybe he didn't find it. Then to stuffism of a, a sort of... Pres I don't want to use the word prosaic because the buildings aren't prosaic at all. But I think the, the, the Amsterdam School, Beterk, this is Be William Beterk, um, and there are two key sort of Amsterdam School guys. One is Beterk, the other is Kramer. Um, here is a drawing that suggests, very, sorry about the minor effect again, suggests a building that could very well be built and probably was built and if it was built it would look like that. In other words it's, it has a considerable degree of prosaic near to the truth rendition. There is I sense then a sort of however interesting the building and here's another of de Klerk's buildings uh, sufficiently accurately coloured to say look guys these, you can see what size of windows we use. You can see what sort of color we're using. Yes, it's going to probably be brick or rent, probably brick because we're brick guys, so you know that. So we don't need to draw the bricks. And there's a sort of ho hum question about the drawing that gets very close to what the building is likely to be. You say, well, yeah, yeah, we know it's brick. Yeah, we know it's sort of like that. Yes, it's very accurate. You My God. The, the shadows cast just in the right place. Oh, you know, and, and I think it's my irritation I have for a lot of computer perspectives is that they're so busy sort of showing what you would actually see that you, you miss what is actually important. You know, it, they're, they're, they're full of sort of chatter. Well, the building itself, you said, is actually better than the drawing. And actually not quite as bland as the drawing. And actually the, the texturing of the brick contributes in a, in a curious way and the tilingness of the pan tile contributes in its own way. It's pretty extraordinary formally anyhow. So I'm sort of pre-editing pre pre the loop. That the and when you draw a de Klerk wall and somebody draws a de Klerk building very sensibly in black line and ink it's sort of, oh yes, that's quite a nice building. Yes, well I suppose he's going to use brick as he usually does. Yes, good, fine, nice. Yes, send it off to the client. Everybody's happy. And there's a sort of, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not a bad building and it's actually not a bad drawing. But again, there's a slight ho-ho, for me a bit sort of ho-hum, 
Yes, it's got every window in it. Isn't that nice? Yes, the shadows are probably in the right place. Isn't that nice? Oh, good, goody, goody. I said, yes, de Clerf, on the other hand, could be pedantic. This is not, I think, his best building. But here, the person rendering it is keen to make sure that we know what color it's going to be and then leaves on. In, in fact, it gets close to, to real, but because it's slightly a technical, maybe there's something about it sort of technical. It's almost sort of ready to be a working drawing that prevents it from being, for my mind, though it's a less interesting building, prevents it from being quite as ho-hum. Forgotten who did this, um, but it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> and then we get to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts proper, a, a bugger to scan. I tried scanning this one four times. It's still getting worried. Well, the Paris Opera, the interesting thing about the Ecole de Beaux-Arts guys is that when they drew, they often drew the interior of the buildings more totally and expertly than they drew the exterior. And the sections, when they drew a section, the sections usually were just sort of white in between two pieces of drawing because they couldn't care a fart how it was built so long as some engineer came along and told them how it was built, as long as the interior would be fully architected and the outside would be fully architected. And, of course, modernism did away with all that. Modernism sa said that the substance, the section, the actual nature of the section was important and somebody would come along and, and slurp it with, with white stuff. This is an old drawing of, whoops, old drawing of mine uh, called Gunge, which was to do with gathering up any old rubbish and slurping it together, and particularly a provocative sort of pink stuff. I had no idea when I did the drawing, still don't, quite what the pink stuff would be, but it would be deliberately unpleasant. Um, and some of the other bits would be pulled off the railway line and borrowed from the, 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 the tip round the corner. And some of them might even be old bits of war. And gunge was a word that I borrowed from Rainer Bannon. He used it in some article or other. A lovely word, meaning gunge. Is a <laughs> and stuff. And that this is a later drawing, but still some time ago now. Uh, suggesting the, the use of a device which was something to do with air supply, air conditioning, lighting, servicing. It's a servicing element. It's a servicing cube done in naughty tone. And this is a very important drawing that if I wind the clock back in this room, if I wind the clock back about 20 20 something years, 20 years. This would probably have been the best known drawing in the A at the time. Uh, and it's by Peter Wilson, who, as you know, lives in Germany. He did with his wife the, the Munster Library, still does some rather good buildings, was a key teacher in this place 20 odd years ago. And this was his most famous drawing called The Fountain House. Absolutely key drawing. Uh, and Peter managed to do something which we all give our back teeth to do, which is to depict water and steam. It's a bad scan from a bad reproduction, but I think you get it. He was able to depict water and steam like nobody else could, and a drawing of which all of us around were grossly envious. At which point, oh no, we've got a willy. We will, will, of course, will also, I, I, though I don't think he personally did this drawing, uh, goes away from predictive. If, if, if Peter was trying to describe the, the materiality of not only the, the concrete blocks in two colors, but also the materiality, the dif difficult materiality or immateriality of steam, and the materiality of water. Will, who's a near contemporary of Peter's and knows him, of course, um, goes the other way and says, OK, it's blue and it's yellow and the underneath is pink and it's probably concrete, but you know, whatever's cheap and cheerful and we'll do it and we'll stick it up on legs and stick it in Toronto, which is a 
you know, nice, polite town uh, and, and, and get on with it, guys. Uh, though the person doing the drawing has then been careful to make sure that you're aware of the fact that the lower building, not by Willie, is a certain sort of brickwork. And that certain sort of brickwork is very Canadian. There's something very, very Canadian about the lower block of its sort of sensible, self-effacing, polite, civilised Canada. Or one takes, you know, a contem relatively contemporary drawing where the selection again of materiality, the Baroque computer-produced drawing, this is a Kenny Sui, um, is deliberately contrasted, not with a Canadian piece of brickwork, but I think a, a piece of Italian brickwork, doesn't matter. Uh, somehow, in both cases, this is an odd, odd linkage which I hadn't thought I would use, it's important to have the pre-existence of the straightforward brick building in order to be aware of the affront or the contrast of the new building. But we're only just talking, we are talking about lots of stuff in terms of stinging stuff. Um, Kenny is still, I haven't trapped him on the subject of, hey, Kenny, what would that actually be made of? Because I suspect, fruity though he is, he's still in the world of, you know, it's made of something as long as it can be poured out and massaged and probably produced in a series of, of enlarged versions of, of the... Uh, computer-produced model. Uh, and sometimes the art object um, can be produced as a linear drawing, but linear drawings that are, again, only just of stuff, assuming that you can get a pink, growy stuff, the enjoyment uh, is to, to draw it. There was a period of, of morphosis work, mid I, would, I suppose it's called mid-period morphosis, uh, when they were still with one leg in the pre-computer world and the other leg in the, ma in the materiality of the predictive object world. The, the models that, that early and middle period morphosis made were fantastic models, the surface of the ground was so juicy, it was e every, every exhibition they ever put these things in, you kind of just died for the, for the surfacing. And then you notice that the building itself, again, it's back to that thing of the, the territory being evocative and the building being clever. This, I think it's a golf club project for Japan, or it's a house, sorry, it's a house project that they didn't build, but at, at a very interesting period in their development, uh, and, and clever as hell as a plan, but rendered that it would be a sort of creamy white architecture. Albeit that they'd already done some restaurants and some small house projects that were very, very material. Ourselves, when borrowing computer skills, so, um, sometimes have tried to disengage from the techniques. How far can you hold off? How far can you suggest that the surface of a building would be made of some kind of agglomerate elements? But at the early stage, the competition said, don't ask us how we hold them together. Please, we'll tell you later if we win the project. Just as those of you sitting <laughs> in that part of the audience know how difficult it is when we win the project and you guys to try and build it. But there is the sort of the, the, the luxury of the held off drawing. And I just grabbed from my bank of, this is by a, a Portuguese architect who works largely in the Azores, um, many, many such projects where it would have been impossible, very difficult to draw the thing without using the computer. And the architect is caught somewhere between the sort of world of schmaltzy uh, reflected light, shadows that are not too correct, but correct enough, and trying to get close to the materiality of the building. And, and knowing that that involves, to some extent, 
both even surface and variability of surface. I then very quickly will move on to the last small number of pictures. Still now into relatively recent times, back with the living, um, uh, Gunther Domenic and his precursor, really, Walter Pichler. Pichler is an exact contemporary of mine who's an Austrian artist who's intriguing in that he has been such a successful artist that as part of his output, he's done a series of drawings of small buildings, has sold enough of the drawings to be able to afford to build the buildings that the drawings are off. I don't think it's probably anybody sitting in this room has that degree of luxury. Uh, extraordinary artist, but somebody who has simultaneously inspired people like Peter Wilson, people like Mike Webb, people like Lebius Woods, if you've got those three people and myself around a table, we could might very well, over a couple of drinks, um, discuss Walter Pischler for about an hour. We're all in awe of Walter Pischler and his ability to somehow have a, a, a vicious sort of tension to his drawings. This one, of course, is very, and he's Tyrolean. To anybody who knows that part of the world, uh, that's a loaded comment. Uh, some of his things are very strange and spooky. And then sometimes they are drawings of buildings, uh, which are curiously traditional. They have to be traditional, and they contain his sculpted pieces, so that the buildings in his farm in Bergenland contain the other objects and light them very, very carefully and shelter them very, very carefully. So it's a whole sort of output. But he is the master of surface and, and pushing the surface onto the drawing. Sometimes he even buys very expensive Scholle Hammer papier and crunches it. If anybody's ever used it, it's very, very stiff paper. It's hard enough to fold it. And crunches it attacks the paper and then draws the drawing over the attack so that the, the paper starts to carry a sort of dynamic upon itself. Gunther Domenig is a close friend and admirer of Walter Pichler and also has built many buildings and also uses a certain Id idiosyncratic Austrian drawing, then transmit it, transmits it into buildings such as the Stein House. My, my scan of the Stein House was so, so moray this morning that I abandoned it, but those of you who know it will know it. Autobiographically, just a little discussion of a piece of the Graz building. A lot of time, money, and energy was spent in discussing the orifices, the, 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 the nozzles. And one kind of drawing is necessary in order to tell third parties what those nozzles will be like. Further, more elaborate rendered computer drawings tell more specifically what they will be like. And then you build it. And to my money, the built thing is so much better than the rendered thing and is what, what it said it was going to be. So it's not as if these drawings are being accurate. But somehow, as soon as the, the, the cleverness or whatever, the rendering starts to take over, it's the quality of tactility that is lost. And this is a very, this in this whole discussion of stuff is a very difficult one. The, the particular quality of a plastic, a shiny plastic, that is constantly rained upon, and actually is, is quite, the building is quite well looked after so far. Uh, and that you see that tactility, particularly in juxtaposition with the tiles, the roof just below all that needs to be said about materiality is said by seeing the tiles and then seeing the plastic. And the edge, even the edges, even the sort of rather, you know, 
we, as I've said many times, it was a relatively cheap building. You can see in the bottom towards the right that we didn't always get the gaps between the panels. I, uh, oh, who's going to notice that? Except some smart ass photographer who gets in, who freezes it for everybody to say, ah, I didn't get your joints very good, did you? But what the fuck anyway? Where's the joints on the drawing across the perfect? Huh? But there's a quality. The, re the reflectiveness, I think, is still a better reflection than some computer would have got it. It would have got it too reflect. It's just a little bit of reflection happening. Yeah. And I, I drew over, you know, and so Afra, sitting in the audience, made this model. It's now been destroyed. Um, still an attempt to go in the opposite direction, say, let's try and go away from the smoothie, smoothie, smoothie and try and find something which is as uglier than any biscuit we've ever come upon. And, and the material, oops. Uh, Markov keeps pushing me off the screen. But let's get the, mater the materiality ought to be gun, it's sort of post-gunge gunge, and it's sort of any old stuff, any old stuff you dig up in the street, put it in the cement slurry and trowel it on with, a, with your foot and keep going. Whereas Marcos Cruz in the early drawing here is trying to deal with skinniness and is using what at the time was the, the method best known to him, which was to do a line drawing and then work over it in color. Though the quality of skin, I think, gets back to this issue. What is the actual nature of a skinny material? Mark Munkenbeck does a double, a sort of easy throw, but one which I recommend to you. The gadgetry is there, I guess accurately, with all its spigots and its working parts and the, the joy of the drifting cable. And then the surface object that it sits against is, is less particular, but very evocative. In other words, just enough indication of the nature of the surface and acts as a marvelous foil to the gadgetry here. And with the gadgets, you don't need to give more. You don't need to say that piece of tin is actually this sort of slightly warped tin. It's a piece of tin or cardboard box or something hang, and it hangs within this ameliorated surface. Uh, and Natalia Treviso, who now works for Morphosis uh, when she was still a student, also uh, a student of the same group, uh, Marcos and Co. And, and again, selecting it that only certain parts of the building, again, it's the same formula, only certain parts of the building need to be given tone and substance. The rest are clever trick bits and pieces hanging around. On the other hand, this kind of depiction is very particular to itself. It incorporates the structured, um, Graham Williamson, who is now part of an office called Block. Um, the, the structure, the, the whole thing is laced in blue, but there are just nuances of another coloration. So it's it's a sort of it's it's a painting that is careful not to over in in enforce the difference between the the ribbed condition and the background condition. Saying yes, the ribs are very call them ribs or twigs or whatever, tubes, are very particular, but we're not going to make them too distinctively different from the rest. And then, inevitably, one comes to Hernan Diaz Alonso, where Hernan's favorite red, ubiquitous red, covering the most obtuse and, and, and extraordinary invention, is occasionally leavened by a, a consciously translucent object. And interestingly to 
interrogate the drawing, you see that the translucent object has a very definite edge. So despite what he might say in lectures, Hanan is very much a child of the architectural tradition, which says that is a piece, and it sits on another piece, albeit it's a piece that sits on. Wow, woolly, wonderful. Um, the name of the guy I've forgotten, but he's the Hungarian who does the uh, the um, digital sort of environments, and he did the Hungarian pavilion in Venice about four years ago. The name I've forgotten. But here is one of his, do I call it drawing, one of his assemblages, which I think makes a very interesting point about material and layering and the translucency of layering. And he does it in an extremely simple way by dangling the different color swatches and makes the point, you know, and, 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 and intriguing selectiveness that an ordinary room somewhere in Budapest filtered first by a single pale layer further filtered, further, further, further. You get the point immediately. It's a very clever piece of assemblage. And I think assemblage is something which we have to include in this, in this diatribe. Finally, I'm coming on to a wonderful book that Eric Moss gave me a few weeks ago, or sent, had sent from China. It's a book literally that thick, that size. It's very heavy, which is why I didn't, I, half of me wanted to bring it in said, look at this. Uh, those of you in the office will be lucky. I'll bring it in next week, prom or week after promise. We need a sort of special mini cab to transport the thing. But it's extraordinary, the most extraordinary book called The Construction Manual. And it is that. It is a manual of buildings constructed and a few that haven't been. Just to look at a couple. Here is Eric. Of course, in, in, in um, Culver City, his stomping ground, little piece of Culver City, some of you may know it, little tit that's sort of hanging on the top of a wall for some kind of graphic production office or something. There he is doing, there he is, Eric Moss, the architect. This is my idea, it's going to be a sort of turd that hangs over the side and has fingers. Okay, got it? Yes? Drawn? Yes? And then you have to model it so some guys in the office start to get some bits of putty and God knows what they use to sort of make this funny little old model and mark things in red, get it going. Then there are working drawings of the conventional kind and then some poor bloke has to start building it. So some, somewhere up, up the road in Culver City with his you know, stuff. Oh. It's one of Eric's things again. Okay. Yes. There we go. Yes. Jeez. God. Spends a tea time. Works his way through. And the bug is built. There it is. It's sort of like it's like. Uh, and it's stuff. The stuff, of course, was consistently there right the way through the process. The key thing about the stuff was that it was going to be made of these bits. That's what Moss was into. For that particular thing, yeah, he you knows about windows. Yes, stairs, sure, yeah. Let's make sure it's a little stuffy bit. And there they are. And there they are on the outside there. And there they are, my God, they're being made. And indeed, there they are. Next to house, I think one of the most interesting house, houses that Moss did in the, the, the house in Brentwood uh, probably predates the other project by few years, not very many years. And a lot of the examinations of the geometry are done with sort of curious projections and models, of models of the very particular cylindrical geometry involved, and then the development of that, turning it up on end, and then wrapping the surfaces around it. This sort of stuff isn't in the stuffist tradition, it's in the working through the geometry's tradition. So perhaps it's a little, well, till you come to the thing. And then we see an orthodox drawing. It is an orthodox drawing, unorthodox building, but orthodox drawing. Uh, an elevation produced well after the event, I think, of the building. 
And the stuff itself, I, went, I, I had the luck to take a group of Bartlett students around the building soon after it was finished. And it was fascinating because it was one of the first buildings that I saw where the, s the material of the s vertical surface continues to be the roof. And moss uses some concoction of sort of cement, rubber, God knows what, so that it is a waterproof surface that can actually also act as a wall. Uh, and so the stuffism here is not to do with the colour. And it's not actually to do with the fact that it's based on a complex geometrical proposition. He's done, he's already proved that he could do that sort of thing. For me, the interesting thing was the materiality. It's very difficult, even in his manual, to find drawings that actually deal with that. But he maybe wants to keep <laughs> the secret secret of how it's done but he concentrates upon the formality. Intriguing, that. Somebody who's very obviously stuff is. I showed you us walking about this building. Now the manuals arrive after we visited the building, and one can see I've diluted. There are about 23 pictures. I've got about four here of the sequence of operation with the tower, the recent tower. Yes, inevitably, the geometrical investigations, documented, diagrammatized. Yes, the inevitable necessary working drawings with Arabs involved. Yes, the developmental models, the physical model, the computer model, the beginning of saying it's, it's all right, guys, it's real, it's going to have real people. Um, although we haven't shown the handrail, yes, we have. We've just about shown the handrail as well, so you know it's going to be like it's like. And indeed, here we have blow by blow by blow by blow by blow, getting the damn thing up, and, and so on, the rest you saw. I briefly skirt over C.J. Lim's work. Uh, again, a whole lecture could be given about it. But somehow, for somebody who was originally a student of mine here, and for the last 20-odd years has been a significant teacher, and architect up the road at the Bartlett, uh, watching him starting off as a hand drawer and then absorbing the potential of the computer just stage by stage by stage by stage very gently. Uh, and still occasionally the odd drawing where you can't quite tell and you don't want to be told how it was produced. Then having reached such a degree of expertise with drawing himself, moving into the drawing being itself a plastic object. The drawing that becomes a bar relief, the bar relief that becomes a three-dimensional relief, a three-dimensional relief which is as much to do with surface and photographics as it is to do with positioning. That's also to do with stuff. And Next time, which is three weeks from here, I will return, I suppose, to the total proposition in talking about heroic stuff. Thank you.